word. Uh, every word. Okay. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to the third class. Next week's class, because we have a panel of four people participating, we're actually going to hold the class in our ocean theater which is as soon as you walk into the aquarium in the front doors. And because of that, we have a lot of extra room in the Ocean Theater. So we're inviting each of you to bring a guest with you to next week's class. Um, we, we can validate your parking. We can't validate theirs. So we just encourage you all to carpool. Thanks. All right. So the structure of this is going to be very similar to what we've always done. So I'm going to introduce your speakers. Speaker one's going to come up. We're going to take about a 10 to 15 minute break. Speaker two will come up, and then we'll do the Q&A at the end of the session. So write down your questions. <laughs> OK, so today we are going to talk about GM salmon. I'm sure many of you have heard about this in the news. It has certainly made the headlines. Our first speaker is Dr. Jonathan Zohar. He is a professor and chair of the Department of Marine Biotechnology at the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology in the University of Maryland. He's also head of its Aquaculture Research Center. He conducts research, de research and development programs in sustainable marine aquaculture, and he has integrated basic and molecular science with applications within the aquaculture industry. His fields of expertise include broodstock management, hatchery technologies, recirculating marine aquaculture, and biotechnology. He has a master's degree in oceanography and marine biology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel and a PhD in fish biology and aquaculture from the University in Paris, France. Dr. Zohar has over 35 years of R&D experience in marine aquaculture and biotechnology, integrating academia with industry. From 1982 to 1990, he led the group on fish reproduction at the National Center for Americulture in a lot, Israel, I keep butchering that. From 1997 to 2010, he served as the director at the University of Maryland Center for Marine Biotechnology. Jonathan has published over 220 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters, and is the author of 10 issued international patents in aquaculture. He is the inventor of ReproBoost, a spawning induction aid that has been used broadly in the aquaculture industry worldwide and has received multiple national and international honors and awards. So that's your first speaker. The second speaker is Dr. Ron Stodish. Stodish? Did I see that right? Stodish. He is the CEO and the president and executive director of Aqua Bounty Technologies. He joined Aqua Bounty in 2006 as the vice president for regulatory regulatory affairs. Prior to, join, to joining Aqua Bounty, Ron was the Executive Vice President for Research and Development at Metamorphics. He previously served as Vice President for Global Pharmaceutical Research and Development at Fort Dodge Animal Health, and he's held a variety of positions at American Cyanamid. He began his career in basic research at Merck. Ron has degrees in biochemistry and over 40 years of experience in the discovery, development, and commercialization of new animal health products. Ron is a member of the Board of Directors for the Biotechnology Industry Organization and serves on their Food and Agriculture Sector Governing Board. He is a member of the World Aquaculture Society, Global Aquaculture Alliance, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the National Institute for Animal, Ag Ag animal Agriculture. So with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Zohar to start us off. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, is the mic OK? I, um, I need the remote. Forgive me if I'm not going to be totally coherent tonight, because I did the mistake like Ron did. We both came from the east. I just arrived from Baltimore a couple of hours ago. So I'm on this east coast. Uh, zone and so on but anyway uh, so I think we have a good like combination of uh, probably expertise and talks here uh, and I use the uh, title that was given to uh, this lecture tonight or this session tonight the promise and the peril of GMOs in aquaculture this is by the way uh, our Institute uh, Institute of uh, Marine and Environmental Technology previously known as the Center of Marine Biotechnology, and it's part of the University of Maryland, downtown Baltimore. Uh, the National Aquarium in, uh, of Baltimore is just next door on the other side of the pier. 
Okay, so yeah, I see already we have some uh, maybe font issues. Uh, but uh, I like to, uh, and I'll start with some introduction of uh, the, the status or the, of, of the, our fisheries, global fisheries, uh, the, the fisheries in the United States, as well as uh, leading to aquaculture and then to genetic engineering. So I'd like to start uh, this type of talk with these two slides that came uh, from the same uh, magazine, The Economist, at a few years interval, The Tragedy of the Ocean, and a few years later, you know, The Economist was, well, a rare, uh, mag rare, you know, uh, again, both of them were like covers on The Economist talking about the promise of, the, of fish farming, the Blue Revolution. And, um, so yeah, something is wrong with those uh, uh, fonts here, so, but hopefully you can read them. And obviously, uh, we all know we are at about uh, 7 billion people, more than 7 billion people. Uh, more, it's very simple, more people eat more fish, so this is the increase in the fish consumption uh, the last, whatever, 60 some years. And, uh, and this is one thing. The other thing that is happening is that uh, the per capita consumption of uh, seafood has been on the increase globally, not so much in this country. Uh, and it went from 10 to uh, 19 kilogram per capita over the past four decades or so. So obviously uh, there is a, a, a very quick increase in food consumption, uh, which uh, led to us becoming very efficient fishers or fishermen, and uh, we are overfishing the ocean. Uh, uh, huge seine nets, uh, big factory vessels, uh, uh, freezers vessels, huge nets. Uh, this is a picture that I took when I uh, visited in China. There is an endless numbers of these small boats, fishermen boats that go and fish out there, and there is not much of a regulation or a control of how much they fish. And uh, fish is obviously uh, the last major hunt and gather animal crop. Uh, again, uh, when you go to the supermarket and you go to your uh, grocery store, you, most people expect uh, wild fish, but you don't expect your poultry to come from the wild, right? Uh, Nobody is asking for, you know, whether you, the chicken that you buy is uh, from uh, the wild or, or uh, is farmed. Obviously, uh, it's all farmed, and this is something that we need to change, I think, globally and in this country. Uh, the concept that, I mean, we cannot continue and consume wild fish. And as a result, obviously, the oceans are harvested at what we refer to as maximal sustainable yields. They cannot give anymore, so there was an increase in the uh, harvests and the landings. Of, and there are different fish species, never mind. Pollock, uh, cod, uh, herring, and so on and so forth. But the fact is that uh, the, 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 the oceans, uh, we became so efficient, we are harvesting what the ocean is giving, uh, but it's, uh, we're harvesting faster than, than what those uh, uh, stocks can uh, reproduce or regenerate. Um, there was a very uh, interesting report. I, uh, um, I recommend it to anyone who is interested uh, to read it. It was, a 12, it was uh, published less than a year ago, 2015, the uh, uh, World Wildlife Foundation Living Blue Planet Report, and they developed an e index for the abundance of fish stocks. And, uh, and that index, they looked at it from 1970. One was for the levels at 1970. And here what you see, that the, what they refer to as the utilized fish, so all these fish that are being used for human consumption, they declined by 50% between 1970 and 2010. So that's quite alarming. Let's talk for a moment about the bluefin tuna. The reason I talk about bluefin tuna is because I have been involved with many programs with the bluefin tuna. Now we run a bluefin tuna aquaculture program, and actually we are the first ones in this country, and that's what I reported as well. Our group reported in the uh, World Aquaculture Society meeting in, in Las Vegas, the first ever production of bluefin tuna juveniles in North America. So big fish, right? I mean, they grow to uh, obviously hundreds of pounds. And, uh, but they are overfished, and of course they are overfished. If you know one bluefin tuna sells in, uh, at, the, at the Tokyo fish market 
at, at, at $1.8 million a fish of 480 pounds. I don't know, you can do the math. What is it for uh, uh, per pound? And, and obviously not every fish is being sold for that price, but we know, uh, well, that's, this is why tuna is overfished. Uh, huge purseiners that go after the tuna, uh, the tuna uh, uh, usually, you know, so they, they're oftentimes being fished and harvested around the reproductive season. This is in the Mediterranean, where they go through the Gibraltar strains into the Mediterranean Sea to reproduce. They are being spotted, the big groups that go to reproduce are being spotted by airplanes or helicopters. They send these uh, seine netters very quickly, and much of it, and this is probably you heard about this thing in aquaculture, uh, or not in fisheries, sorry, uh, IUU. It's a big term now in, aqu in, in fisheries. It's uh, illegal. Un underreported and unregulated fisheries. Right. So much of it uh, falls under this category of IUU. They put the fish in, in, uh, in these uh, uh, pens that they tow to floating net pens, they fatten them and they sell them to the, uh, uh, to the Japanese market uh, mostly. And the, again, the World Wildlife Foundation in a report they published in April to 2009 concluded that the Mediterranean bluefin tuna has only three years left unless fishery closes. And you know it's the same stock. I mean, the, the Atlantic bluefin tuna, some of them go across the Atlantic and they go between uh, the, the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Mexico, coming along all the east coast of the, the Canadas and the United States into the, uh, the Gulf Coast to reproduce. And uh, well, while this uh, projection didn't happen because uh, all the regulatory agencies associated with tuna uh, imposed very strict quotas and, and, and started to enforce them, despite the fact that there is a lot of I illegal underreported and uh, and uh, illegal underreported and uh, unregulated, yeah, unregulated. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but what did happen is, again, from the same uh, World Wild Foundation uh, Living Blue Planet report, which is a big uh, report and very interesting to read, uh, the index, the same index that I described a minute ago for Scrombide, which includes tuna, mackerel, and bonito, went down, declined 74% between 1970 and 2010. It's huge and it's alarming and it's a problem. So uh, here is another example of a study that was published, a very visible study published in Science uh, in 10 years ago, impacts of biodiversity loss on ocean ecosystem. The same day, all the major uh, media venues had it uh, on their front page uh, saying 90% of what this study concluded, that 90% of the ocean's edible species may be gone by 2048 uh, if we don't do anything about it. Um, and this is another, uh, this is from the so FAO, SOFIA, the state of the aqua, the state of fisheries and aquaculture, uh, the state of fisheries and aquaculture report of the FAO 2014 is the latest that there is out there. And probably you don't see, so I'll tell you what is written here. Uh, this, uh, th those percents show that, uh, that 28, about 29% of our uh, main uh, marine fisheries stocks are overfished. And this number is, has been on the increase continuously. You see this, this is growing. Uh, and 61% uh, of our main uh, fisheries stock ha are fully fished. And this number is increasing as well. Only 9.9%, the latest number that we have for, is for 2011, of our fishery stocks, the main marine uh, uh, important fishery stocks uh, were underfished, 9.9 percent, and this number, uh, and, and this number is on a decline. So <laughs> those numbers, the overfished and the fully fished, are going up, and this number, the underfished, is uh, declining. So it is a sad. Those are really sad trends. And I put this uh, slide for uh, Dr. Jerry Shubo. Uh, I thought he would be here, but apparently he's sick, just to bring it a little bit back home, home to the Chesapeake <laughs> Bay. And he was uh, working at the Chesapeake Bay uh, in, the, in the 70s. So I think when he was in the Chesapeake Bay, there was plenty of oysters between Maryland and Virginia. 
but those oysters are gone. And the same is true for the blue crab in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so, I mean, this is obviously a, a global trend, but it's a local trend uh, here in, in the United States and, and, and around the world. So, uh, and again, I apologize for those fonts. Uh, uh, so, to give you the U.S. perspective in terms of, uh, sorry, to give you uh, the, the, the U.S. perspective in terms of fisheries and aquaculture. So, many commercial fisheries in the Atlantic and the Pacific are overfished. The U.S. now, as a result, is the world's largest importer of seafood. Over 90% of the seafood in this country comes from overseas. Now, the United States can be proud, quote unquote, that they took the lead because until a year ago it was Japan. And now the U.S. Uh, is importing, is like the first, the largest importer of seafood, took over Japan first place. Uh, the seafood imports contribute about $11 billion annually more, probably, to the trade deficit, largest among all agricultural products. Aquaculture, as a result, aquaculture is the fastest growing agri-industry in the United States. It grows, at a, 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 it grows at a pace of about 8% annually, mostly freshwater, though, uh, as you'll see in a, in a minute, uh, compared to beef that grows at about 1.5% annually, and poultry uh, about 5% annually. However, the sad part of all of this, despite of all of this, US ranks only number 14 in the world in the value of its aquaculture. It produces about 300,000 tons of fish, uh, of seafood annually, of aquatic foods annually. Only 35% is marine, including salmon, obviously, but you know, shrimp and uh, uh, oysters and clams and so on. And only 5% of the marine is, uh, is fin fish. And the value of this industry is 1.2 billion, ranking number 14 in the world is not very good. So, but as a result of those, uh, everything that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the trends in the, fisher, in the fisheries and the fish stocks and so on, what we are witnessing, what we are witnessing is a growing uh, gap between the increasing demand. So people do go off red meat into poultry and off poultry into seafood for the health benefits and so on. And so uh, a gap between the increasing demand and the, at best, stable, uh, uh, stable fisheries, landings uh, uh, of, of supplies of fisheries product. And the challenge for aquaculture is to fill this gap between uh, th that, that increasing gap. And actually, the challenge is greater because, as I mentioned a minute ago, many of these commercially important marine fisheries products are on a steep decline. So aquaculture, uh, globally, responding to that situation has been on the increase worldwide. And as I said, in the United States, you can see capture fisheries, the, uh, the status of capture uh, fisheries here, all the way to 20, whatever it is, 12 or 13. Uh, and as we said, uh, it's at maximal sustainable yield. Uh, and the aquaculture production globally has been on, on an increase. And uh, last year was the first year when uh, aquaculture produced about half of the seafood that we consume globally. Uh, so aquaculture has been growing uh, and needs to grow much, much faster, as I said, in uh, the United States. And by the way, this is what we discussed over dinner a, a few, uh, half an hour ago or so. Fish are very efficient protein producers, much more than any other animal crop. So for, any, for, one, pound, uh, uh, for one pound of fish produced, you need 1.1 uh, pound of food. Compare it to cattle, for one pound of cattle, we need to feed them 6.8 six pound, pound of, of feed. For pigs, it's 2.9. For broiler, for chicken, it's 1.7, and fish is 1.1. So fish are by far the best producer of protein. And that's another interesting uh, article for you to read. National Geographic, uh, almost two years ago, came up out with a very nice story on, on, on aquaculture. Um, so, 
Aquaculture has this huge challenge to meet, right? And uh, currently, 2013 are the latest number, numbers. It's a 97 million ton, $157 billion industry. Aquaculture must increase production two to three times by 2030, the experts believe, to, uh, to meet the challenge, to fill this gap that I showed you a minute ago. For that, it must become more efficient and cost effective, much more efficient. For that, it needs to overcome all kinds of biological obstacles or hurdles. And for that, it needs a strong input for modern biology and biotechnology. So from the gene to the whole animal. And so this is where uh, bi biotechnology is so important to, uh, to make sure that aquaculture becomes more efficient and cost effective and uh, can meet the challenge. And here where we come to Aqua Bounty's fish, uh, to Ron's uh, fish, the uh, genetically engineered fish, the promise and the peril. And uh, you'll hear much more about this fish uh, uh, after uh, my talk. Uh, and, and it's quite amazing. Those are uh, siblings. And these are the genetically engineered for growth hormone. And this is the non-genetically engineered. And what is genetic engineering? And probably you uh, talked about it quite a bit uh, in the in previous weeks, but it's a direct, it's a direct uh, human manipulation of genome of an organism using nucleic acid, uh, nu nucleic acid-based te techniques. So basically, nucleic acid-based techniques is like you, uh, it's DNA-based based technology, and uh, I don't want to spend much time on, on it, but it's introducing a foreign or synthetic DNA or genes into the genome of an organism. Or, and that's another thing that we just mentioned, there is a whole developing field of uh, you can knock out genes, get rid of genes, and also increase efficiencies uh, that way. But the most important thing that this has to be heritable, that it goes uh, from through generations. And the history is that, uh, and probably you discussed this as well, 1980 was the first re report of microinjection of recombinant molecules. Uh, DNA basically to a mouse and uh, the, this is a very famous nature paper that came out in 1982 which showed a phenotype, showed a, a genetically uh, engineered uh, mice expressing red growth hormone and they grew faster. This was the first genetically engineered animal uh, that, uh, for growth hormone. 1983, first report of successful insertion of exogenous genes into plants, and probably you talked about it a lot during the previous weeks. 1985 was the first report of, the trans of a transgenic fish, but by uh, Zhuayen Zhu, a friend of ours. He's a big, huge shot in China right now. He did it in Goldfish at Johns Hopkins University in collaboration with all of us at the time in Maryland. And, uh, and, and so he started basically uh, the field uh, in, in fish. And focus, the focus on genetic engineering uh, in fish was on growth hormone, like the Aqua Advantage salmon. And this is a study on coho salmon. I'll get back to it in a minute. And uh, this was, these were early studies uh, in tilapia. Uh, and uh, again, the history here in terms of uh, aquatic organisms, 1985 was the goldfish. Then came first experiments in salmon, uh, uh, sorry, in trout. Then came catfish, then came uh, loach and zebrafish and salmon and, uh, and, and tilapia and, and then carps and, and so on, medaka and, and even clams. And, so, and, and there are way over, we lost, we, we don't count anymore, but there are way over 40 aquatic uh, species so far, this goes a few years back, that have been genetically engineered for different types of traits, mainly growth. Um, now I want, and this is also a slide I, I received from uh, John Buchanan. I want to, uh, who is, uh, uh, it's uh, the, the research organization associated with Aqua Bounty, uh, the aqua, Aquaculture uh, Research uh, Technology Center for, Cent aquaculture. Center for Aquaculture Technology. Sorry. Uh, so it's, I can say it's the research. Yeah, right. The, I'm telling you that's the little bit the, the time of the day, but uh, in, on the East Coast. But uh, anyway, uh, just to put things in perspective, and we probably talked about it a lot. Uh, we have been eating without blinking, you know, genetically modified plant crops for many, many years, right? Uh, here are some of the statistics uh, worldwide. 
Uh, there are about 366 million acres in 90, uh, of, of genetically modified crops in 29 countries. 25% globally, in the US it's 70% of all planted crops. The global value of genetically modified seeds is f about $15 billion. Uh, the US, global is in parentheses, uh, GM crops. 88% of the corn that we eat uh, in the US is genetically modified. In the world it's about 35%. 90% of the cotton is genetically modified. 90 plus percent of papaya is genetically modified. 94% of the soybean in this country, the world 81%, is genetically modified. 95% of sugar beets is genetically modified. I don't know, you probably discussed it, right, last week or the week before and so on. And, I mean, uh, nobody says anything about this, right? Uh, we'll get back to the fish in a minute. Uh, and many other vegetables and fruits. Now, in terms of animal, going into the animal now, uh, genetically engineered, engineered crop, there is a huge amount of interest because you can improve performance, growth rate, disease resistance of different uh, animal crops, environmental compatibility, metabolic pathways, uh, and, uh, and there is a huge amount of genetically modified uh, animals, are genetically modified animal models that are used for research, going from zebrafish into goats into, uh, I mean, you name the animal, rats and mice and so on and so forth, and none of it is regulated, and it has been going for many, many years. Uh, and there is also a huge interest in producing uh, industrial or commercial products. Products You heard about a cow that is genetically engineered for uh, a vaccine, uh, and it goes into the milk, and you drink the milk, and you get vaccinated, and things like that, and pharmaceutical, and even a goat that produces silk in the uh, milk. Well, the aqua advantage salmon is the first animal food, you know, crop. That, uh, and this is why this entire controversy and, and so on. So, genetically modified fish. Here is how it works. You have, as I said earlier, you have to inject uh, a foreign DNA into a very early uh, life stage of embryo of the fish. Um, and it's being done under the microscope with a very tiny micro-injector. Um, and then I said it's heritable. So after a few generations of breeding and crossing, and I'm not going to go into the details, all the animals now have the foreign gene. Uh, and this is a small... So just again, before you run the uh, video, so uh, a gene, probably you talked about it too, right? And I'm not going to... Uh, yeah, here you were micro-injecting it into... It's not a salmon egg, it's a zebrafish egg. Uh, but it's a very early stages of the embryo. And the gene is made of two pieces. I'm very, being very simplistic here. You know, a, a promoter, which is like the engine that drives the expression of the gene. And then this promoter would drive the expression or the production of a growth hormone, in the case of, you know, the aqua advantage salmon, or uh, an immune type of uh, response. So you, uh, there is a huge interest in making fish become more, or animals, become more resistant to disease. And this is how we are micro-injecting it. And uh, salmon eggs are bigger. Those uh, zebrafish eggs are about, uh, which is the zebrafish model that everybody studies, are about one millimeter in diameter. Salmon eggs are about six millimeter in diameter. And here you can see them micro-injected. And I'm, I'm, I'm making this point, and that's what happens uh, in the case of the Aqua Advantage salmon as well. It's very important that we do all fish construct that we are going to micro-inject to the fish. So the, both the promoter, the engine that drives the gene, and the uh, gene itself that expresses the growth hormone are coming from fish. So it's not like human growth hormone that goes into fish. Or it's not like viral, promoters for viruses that go, and people do it in science. But this is not the case here. It's very important that the gene is going to be all, I mean, uh, the construct, we call it, is going to be an all-fish construct. And these are the very early studies that uh, led to, uh, to the commercialization of this uh, technology that were done by a few scientists. One of them is Jim Du, who is a faculty member now in our institute. Uh, he was what, a PhD student at the time. And here they uh, de developed the first production of fast-growing transgenic Atlantic salmon using the first all-fish gene construct. 
So this is the same one that, uh, uh, that Aqua Bounty is using. And look, I mean, those are the earlier results, for 15 months, siblings, nine months, 24 months. And then, uh, again, the, the two major scientists that were uh, uh, developing this technology were Cho Yu, he was at, uh, in, the, in Toronto, University of Toronto at the time, and Garth Fletcher at the Memorial University of, of uh, Newfoundland. And they were all both very good friends, uh, have been for many years. And they came out with this, uh, this initial, uh, this was in 19, a publication in 1997, this is an initial data, and it's quite amazing, right? If you see the transgenic, genetically engineered fish, how much faster they grow. So this, in this case, 500 grams, about a, over a pound, in less than a year, because the fish were like spawned in November or something, December, is quite amazing for Atlantic salmon. And then uh, in 1994 uh, was this a seminal publication that came was in nature from Bob Devlin. I'm going to talk a, a lot about the Bob Devlin today. Uh, a lot. I'm going to talk about Bob Devlin today. Uh, he's from uh, fisheries, Oceans and Fisheries in Canada, in the, the West Vancouver uh, University. An amazing scientist, and you'll see some of the things that he uh, has been doing. Uh, so the, the title was like Extraordinary Salmon Growth in, uh, in Coho Salmon in this case. And those were like uh, genetically engineered for the growth hormone. Now if you look at some of the fish, I know, some, I mean, I know you are involved with seafood, and so, you see, so they don't look that good, right? And if you look closely, many of them uh, had deformations and stuff. This is also a little bit distorted because of the slide, but whatever. But they, were, they are deformed. And this brings me to discuss a very important uh, key principle. And I'll try to explain it. It looks complicated, but it's not. And, and this is what we, the scientists, have been saying, that there is only a very narrow window of of dosage, we call it. So how many copies you can inject genetically engineered into a fish? Hundreds, millions of copies of the genes. And, and you can have a promoter, that this engine that drives the gene that is very strong. But then your fish are going, you see, if you increase the dosage or the promoter strength, uh, you, the growth of the fish is going to increase and then it's going to go down. The viability is going to go down if it's too high. The abnormalities are going to go up and so on. So you have to, that's the whole secret, is to stay within a very uh, narrow window of dosage. And that's what uh, the scientists, aqua bounty scientists, were, were uh, doing. So the aqua advantage salmon ended up, and you'll hear it probably from Ron later, and it's, I can't overemphasize it, I mean, it's a single copy, one copy of the fish growth hormone gene, okay? Single copy. And, uh, and it's an all fish gene, uh, growth hormone gene, and they worked out all the condition to optimize a beautiful animal that does not grow, grow, does not grow larger. It grows faster, but not larger. And this animal, the aqua advantage salmon, makes it to four kilograms, like 10 pounds, in, in less than two years, compared to three, four years in, in a non-genetically engineered salmon. And again, beautiful animal, they look good, no deformations, and so on. So, aqua advantage salmon, I'm sure Ron will talk more about 20 years of FDA review, why so long, how much did it take for the flavor saver tomato to be, uh, to be approved? I think three years. This, this took 20 years, right? And why is it? Uh, a lot of because of that. The public concern. And Time Magazine, we all respect Time Magazine, and you can name any, 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 uh, any news venue, any uh, media venue. Uh, Time Magazine, every time that FDA said something about the genetically engineered, and I was, I was involved with the FDA pro process. I consulted to FDA as a, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, fish scientist, and so on during the process. But every time that FDA said something, Time magazine came with negative stuff, came with this like make way for Franklin fish. This was 20, 2000. And then in 2010, there was this uh, uh, very important uh, hearing. Uh, FDA did a public hearing, and, uh, and I. Uh, 
testify there and run, and uh, I explained to the committee uh, the, the whole concept of aquaculture and the, the, the science of genetic engineering and so on. And, and by then, more or less, they made the decision that, I mean, the fish is good to go, right? And, and then uh, Time Magazine newsfeed came and said, would you eat genetically altered meat? And uh, it said the Food and Drug Administration is within steps of green lighting genetically modified salmon as a safe food product. And this led them immediately to, uh, to get this out. And then at the December 2012, I think uh, FDA said that, OK, there is no risk associated, not environmental or health risk associated with genetically modified salmon. And then this was not Time Magazine at this time. But I mean, there was many, many. And, and Ron can tell you, I mean, much more than me. Let's think about it for a minute, OK? Let's think about it. I mean, we're all warned, and there is all this scare tactic about not, not to touch, not to eat genetically modified uh, fish, in this case, salmon. But are the genetically modified fish different from selectively bred domestic fish? We have been selectively breeding crops, animal crops, and fish for many, many years. And this is also a study by Bob Devlin from fisheries and oceans in Vancouver, in Canada. And here's what you see. These are like, Atla sorry, this is rainbow trout now. These are rainbow trout from the rivers, from the wild. They, they are like non-genetically engineered, non-selected. And now, during many years of genetic selection, you make them to grow to this size. Now, if you genetically engineer them, they grow to this size. But if you try to genetically engineer the uh, selectively bred, you can't do any better. <coughs> what do we do when, when we genetically engineered fish for growth, for faster growth? We add one copy of the fish on growth hormone, right? What do we do when we selectively bred, breed? We change so many genes that we don't know what we did. And, and nobody has any problem with selectively bred animals, although selective breeding is changing the, 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 the genome, the, the gene makeup of the fish or, or an animal for it to perform, to go from that to that. And, uh, and uh, excuse me, I, it looks complicated, looks a little bit scientific and stuff, but again, it's a very uh, important point in my opinion and along the same line. Uh, those are the, there is a, a hormonal cascade Okay, that is responsible for the growth of the fish, growth hormone, but there are some factors that we call IGF and thyroid hormones and so on. This is what happened in, uh, when we do genetically engineered fish, uh, wild type, non-genetically engineered levels of these hormones, and when we do the, this is in genetically engineered fish, okay? So we have a small increase, but it's all in, within the physiological level. It's not going out of range. It's not going ballistic and completely out of range. It's very within the physiological range of growth hormone and the other hormones, IGF and the, the thyroid hormone. Look at the domesticated fish. The same, exact the same. So why, why do we oppose genetically engineered fish, but we don't oppose do, uh, domestic, selectively bred domesticated fish? And so the, the conclusion here is that genetically enhanced transgenesis and or genetically, growth, sorry, gross hormone transgenesis or gross hormone genetic engineering and domestication use similar endocrine, hormonal pathways to realize enhanced growth. And they have the same exact phenotypes. So again, you know, it doesn't make sense. And I wrote after this hearing in 2010 an op-ed to CNN, and that's the point that, I, the point that I make because we modify more genes by doing selective breeding uh, or the, uh, the gene makeup of an animal, the gene signature, than we do with the genetically engineered. And so the FDA process, why did it take 20 years? And I know that probably you're going to talk about some of these, uh, but there is what we call the, uh, the FDA pyramid. It's a highly regulated process. They wanted to know everything. They wanted to know if it's, if it's the real fish and so on, and I'm not going to say much about it just that it was all this kind of paperwork, and I had to read much of them when I worked with the FDA. And, and then we were stuck there for about five years since October 20, or September, October 20, uh, 2010, until it was approved a few months in November 2015. We were stuck there. 
But one thing that I want to talk a little bit in the context of what we are saying here is the environmental risk assessment and ask the question, are genetically engineered salmon fit to live in the wild? We don't want them to escape to the wild. They will not. You know, and you'll see in a minute, and you'll hear from more and more. But, uh, but if they escape to the wild, can they survive there? So here's, that's from Bob Devlin as well. And can you run this video? Because I cannot do it from here. Uh, this is a controlled fish, non-manipulated, and this is the genetically engineered coho salmon. You feed those guys. You see, they are very careful. Those guys, they don't, they're not careful at all. They're very aggressive feeders. They go to the surface, and they, uh, Run it again. Well, anyway, yeah, you see, those guys are very careful. They go, they stay at the bottom. Those guys are very aggressive feeders. They take a risk. And that's the point here. So Bob Devlin and his group, they uh, constructed like semi-natural conditions. They had the fish genetically engineered and not genetically engineered in tanks where they have predators, birds, birds of prey. And you can see here, when uh, they, they fed the fish, so uh, here they were feed 10 seconds post-feeding and so on. Those fish, as you saw in the video, the non-genetically engineered remained at the bottom, and those fish went all the way up. And then there was a predator coming, and they went down and back up. You know, they, uh, they don't care. You know, they don't, uh, it's like more than their urge to survive. Uh, and and I I indeed, uh, if you, those are like the semi-natural environments without, uh, this is like with no predator, uh, they all, the non-transgenic and the transgenic fish, they have the same survival. As soon as you add predators, uh, you can see this decrease in survival. So in other, wor in other words, high feeding activity results in increased predation, mortality, and reduced fitness. So they are less fit. They are not going to survive very well at all when, if they escape to the environment. Now, this is even a more elegant uh, study from Bob Devlin and his group. And what he did here, he, this is aquaculture conditions, and these are the simulated nature conditions. So if you, gave the f you feed them at satiation, you give them as much as food as they want, uh, this is the non-genetically engineered, and this is the genetically engineered salmon, coho salmon. And here is when you put them in natural, semi-natural condition with uh, uh, predators and like not aquaculture condition. So this is like a fish from the wild. This is uh, a fish that uh, is in this condition uh, and, and, and non-genetically engineered aquaculture uh, salmon. And this is the genetically engineered in the simulated nature, uh, kind of a simulated nature type of condition. So this is what it does in aquaculture tank. This is what it does in the nature, in the wild. So the uh, conclusion is that transgenic fish are not well fit to survive in the wild. We don't want them to go to the wild. They will not. But I mean, there is good indication that they will not survive in the wild, even if they go out there. OK, uh, this is from the FDA. And, and uh, so they did, and in my opinion, this is very, that's why, and I know you probably may be going to talk about it as well. But in my opinion, it's a very important point in this whole field of genetically engineered fish and animals in general, the environmental risk assessment and mitigation. And ignore these rounds now, ignore, ignore, ignore the yellow uh, well, ellipses here. And so what FDA was looking at, at the facility where you grow the fish, can the fish escape or not? If they can escape, are they going to be able to make it to the environment? If they're going to make it the environment, are they going to be able to survive? As we saw, probably not very well. Are they going to be able to reproduce? I didn't show you this data. Probably not very well. Are they going to be able to disperse, to establish, and to spread the gene, the transgene, the, and then to have a direct impact on their resources? So what the FDA required, and that's part of the approval process, and that's what the Aqua Bounty group worked on so hard to make sure there, is, there are multiple levels of containment, redundancy, redundancy of containment. So where you grow the fish, the fish cannot escape from there. It's completely what we refer to as biosecure. No eggs or no fish can go out and, and go to the wild. And then there is the biological containment. Biological containment is meaning that the fish are reproductively sterile. They cannot reproduce. 
And then I'm going to talk very quickly about this, uh, those two points, and Ron probably will tell you that the third point is the geographical and geophysical containment. So Aqua Bounty decided to grow the fish in such a situation that even if they escape, they cannot survive. The, the hatchery, the broodstock and the hatchery and the juvenile production is in Prince Edward Island and the grow-out production is, so if fish are going to escape from there, the water is too cold, they cannot survive and the uh, grow-out operation is in Panama and if they, on the mountain, so if they escape, they will not be able to survive. And, but, but I want to explain to you a little bit about the, the containment, the other containment uh, uh, points and biological containment. We are talking about producing sterile fish and we are doing it through triploidy. You know, so how many sets of chromosomes do we have? We are diploids, we have two ends, right? One set of chromosomes come from the sperm, one from the egg. And this is what happens when you have fertilization, egg, sperm, one set of chromosomes from the female, that, from the egg that was used to be diploid, is being ejected. And, the, and, and, and then you are ending up with a, a, a diploid salmon, which is fertile. Now, the, the technology of triploidy is uh, developing animals that have three sets of chromosomes. And what you do, you avoid the uh, ejection of, uh, of one set of chromosomes from the egg. You use heat or pressure shock at the time of fertilization. This one set of chromosomes that is usually uh, going to uh, be ejected and not used stays there and you end up with animals that now have three sets of chromosomes become, and because this is like three sets and not two there is an issue, there is a problem in reproduction because the reproduction is based on the fact that diploid uh, embryos or diploid animals are producing haploid, one end, they, they, they divide into two, right? And then they merge back into diploids and triploids cannot do that, so those are sterile. However, a lot of uh, effort went into the uh, development of triploid fish and sterility and the aqua advantage fish are sterile and triploid and so on, but there have been uh, some issues, triploidy has been rep reported, to, uh, reported to have, sorry, triploidy has been reported, ah, no, triploidy has been reported to reduce growth rate and overall performance. Now, triploidy and sterility in fish is not only important for aqua advantage salmon or for genetically engineered fish. You know, you heard, and I think you had another course here about uh, the whole issue of uh, net pen production of fish and the, the issue of escapees. And if you have an Atlantic salmon that escapes from cages in the Pacific Northwest, by definition, there are no native. And, and, and so on, and uh, the, the big and, and farmed fish are domesticated, are selectively bred, they are different from wild fish. In Norway, the big threat, one of the biggest threats to the industry is those escapees. They interbreed with the wild stocks, and they, or between themselves or with the wild stocks, and they displace the wild stocks, which is a huge problem. So there is, uh, so sterility uh, uh, needs to be developed, not only for the genetically engineered fish, but for aquaculture fish in general, and uh, we have been, and that's a topic of another whole lecture, we, my lab, have been developing a new and non-GMO, I'm saying non-GMO because we didn't want to go into another 20 years waiting for approval, <laughs> uh, approach to sterility. What we do, we do a short-term immer immersion of eggs at the time of fertilization, like in salmon, you strip the eggs from the female, you strip the male, and you fertilize, it's like in vitro fertilization. At that time, you immerse the eggs in some compounds, again, those are all animal compounds, that specifically disrupt the early development of the reproductive system and results in sterile fish. Our approach was to start to develop this, which we did in the zebrafish model, because it reproduces at three months of age, so you know by three months if it is sterile or not, as opposed to Atlantic salmon that takes at least two years, most, mostly three years to reproduce. And, and so uh, we did fast screening in compounds and development of product in zebrafish, then experimenting in salmon, which we do right now with the salmon industry. And again, I can talk about it at a different time, but uh, and that, you know, we're, that's what we're doing, experimenting with salmon, uh, with the industry, as I said, and we are doing, uh, and uh, we had, have very exciting product, pro progress with 100% sterility, with no side effects on performance issues, so hopefully this will 
maybe be another alternative approach to the triploidy, which is kind of, at least in Norway and in Europe, is rejected by the industry. And then the final thing is the full containment using land-based, biosecure, marine aquaculture operation that 10 years ago people said you cannot do it, but obviously you can do it. These are all pictures. I'm bragging a little bit from the basement of our building, the Columbus Center in, in the inner harbor of Baltimore. It's all recirculating. It's all based on microbial uh, biofiltration that remove the chemical waste produced by the fish. And we grow, this is the gilted sea bream, a high value marine fish, it's non-native. We can only grow it, not only genetically engineered fish needs to be grown in land-based, completely biosecure and contained environment. It's true also for new species that you want to introduce in this country. And this is the gilted sea bream, high density of fish, very pristine water. It's the same water for the nine months of the growth cycle. We don't change the water. It's all based on like, the microbial biofiltration. And uh, that's something that also we are very proud of, that all our organic waste, 95%, is converted to biogas, to methane, fuel-grade methane. And we can you know, just burn it or start a generator. This is a methane-driven generator. We start off the fish tanks and produce electricity, which is going to offset some of the cost, operation cost of the operation as we are going to scale it up. Now, uh, I think land-based aquaculture offers a great, in my opinion, a keyword to uh, success in aquaculture is diversification. You know, how many species you have of chicken, although I know Jim Perdue is from Maryland, right? And it's, uh, well, you only there is this chicken and that chicken. Okay, but uh, it's not like the diversification that we have in, in aquaculture and fisheries and so on. So we grew in this our system, high value marine fish, cobia, uh, bronzini or bronzino, which is the European sea bass. Blue crab, of course, right? Go Maryland, right? So we do, we do the blue crab, and we are the only ones actually in, in the world that close the life cycle and develop, developed hatchery technologies for the uh, blue crab, and we do it for oysters as well. And the question is obviously in the context of this uh, presentation, can we do it for salmon, Atlantic salmon? And the answer is absolutely yes. And Aqua Bounty is, co is uh, collaborating with Steve Sommerfeld at the Freshwater Institute in West Virginia, which is by far the best uh, aquaculture engineering group in the country in developing. And you can see high density of Atlantic salmon in their system in West Virginia and uh, phenomenal growth rate. So, I mean, th th it's not a problem. Okay, I'm going to conclude now by saying uh, that, uh, in, again, taking, uh, thinking about everything that we, uh, yeah, right, uh, everything that, uh, that, that we discussed right now, I think that uh, genetic engineering, in my opinion, offers huge opportunities in aquaculture because, yes, because you could tailor now, Aqua Bounty has done it for growth, growth hormone and so on. Much of the focus is for fish that grow better and make the whole industry most cost efficient and, and, and economically feasible. But the next thing, and I'm sure they are working on those things, I mean, to make uh, disease is a huge problem in aquaculture. So make fish more, be more uh, res uh, disease resi resistant, environmentally tolerant. Salmon grown in, in uh, I have done, I've, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, the uh, Atlantic salmon industry in, in, the, in, in Maine, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Atlantic Northeast, in Maine and New Brunswick, Canada, and those fish uh, die because the water is too cold in the, in, uh, in, the, in the winter, there is this super chill, the immune system is compromised, they become sick, so environmental tolerance is something that you can also tailor your fish or animals in general, you can uh, uh, increase the nutritional value of your fish. You know, omega-3, we have it in which kind of fish? Yeah, in marine fish. In marine fish, not only salmon, <laughs> but not in freshwater. Carp does not have, uh, but there is already, there are already studies, carp, tilapia, catfish, they do not. But now what if you are going to genetically engineer your carp, or, carp or, or catfish or tilapia to produce omega-3s? And it's being already done. There are studies. It's, uh, it's, it's at the research level. And I discussed vaccines. So there are studies already in terms of uh, genetically engineering shrimp to produce a, a, a vaccine. And then you eat shrimp and you uh, get vaccinated, although you have to eat it raw. That's a little bit of a problem. And then, yeah, taste, texture, color, shape, and so on. Just to conclude, uh, a few concluding comments, as I think you uh, well, I conveyed this through my talk. 
genetic, uh, ge genetically modified fish offer, in my opinion, gr sorry, great promise to aquaculture. I think it's very important. All fish gene construct and single genes are crucial, and so you have to do the same tedious studies that Aquabandi did for many years to calibrate everything to be perfect and to use the all fish gene. Uh, there are ways to do it that is not responsible, but you have to do it in a responsible way. Land-based culture, full biosecurity, and sterility are critical. Now, in my opinion, we need better method to bi for biological containment, sterility, and I showed you this one slide on what we do. And I think that's also very important in my opinion. We need uh, to run a thorough environmental risk assessment studies for any uh, new trait or any new fish that we genetically engineered. And I think one reason why the FDA took so long is because they wanted to make sure that there, there is no environmental risk associated, which in my opinion is, and I mean, I don't think much is being done in terms of plant crops, you know, to make sure that there is no environmental risk assessment of a, a, risk, a risk of spreading the, 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 those seeds and, and so on. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, because of, of my first point and because of the first historic FDA approval, GMO in aquaculture will gain, will gain popularity real soon. China, probably, I mean, you know this better than me, and my colleague uh, Zhuayan Zhu, they are waiting uh, with a, a number of genetically engineered fish that they have waiting in the pipeline, ready to be implemented in the industry, and it will happen now. So China, India, followed by the rest of the world. Um, Okay, well, this is another nice slide from our operation. I wanted to thank you for your attention. But I'm happy to talk to you if you want. Baltimore will be hosting, this is the inner harbor of Baltimore. Uh, this is the, our institute. This is uh, the National Aquarium in Baltimore. We'll be hosting the next International Marine Biotechnology Conference, uh, August 29th to September 2nd, 2016, and we'll have a dedicated session. And Ron, uh, we hope to have you as our keynote speaker there on genetically engineering in aquaculture, but it's a marine biotechnology uh, conference.
meet you and, and uh, to come and tell you a little bit about what we do. It's also a pleasure to share the program with a, uh, a dear friend and a real giant in aquaculture research, uh, Dr. Yoni Zohar. Yoni's done me a great service by introducing you to a lot of the material that I'm going to talk about today. And what I hope to do is just tell you our story. Along the way, I'll tell you some of the things that we did in approaching this project and why we think this is a, a, not only a responsible but a safe and sustainable source for seafood of the future. So uh, I've, this is a variation of a talk that I gave at the World Aquaculture uh, Meeting, World Aquaculture Society meeting a few weeks ago in Las Vegas called Science and Society. I think every, well, perhaps not everyone, but many people like salmon. Uh, salmon globally is a $10 billion industry. Uh, the salmon producers around the world produce over 2.1 million tons of salmon every year. Uh, probably the people in this room know that if you're eating Atlantic salmon, you're almost certainly eating a farm species. There are very few wild Atlantics. There are recreational fisheries, and I think there's still a little bit of a, a commercial fishery off the coast of Iceland, but the, primarily the Atlantic salmon is a farm species, something to the tune of something like 97% of the Atlantic salmon consumed. So it's a huge industry, a huge business, and almost exclusively farmed. In the U.S., we consumed in 2014 something like 260,000 tons of Atlantic salmon with a value of almost $2.4 billion. That was imported from countries like Chile, uh, Norway, the Faroe Islands, the UK, and, and a few other countries. Uh, I, we talked about it at dinner. I, th I think it should be a source of, of national shame that we produce so little salmon, and in fact that we have such a small aquaculture industry in the United States. More than 60% of global aquaculture, and Yanni didn't mention this, happens in the Far East. China being the 800-pound gorilla. And developing countries around the world have been doing aquaculture for years. Primarily in Salmonids, it's Norway and Chile. And if you've been reading the news, you've seen that in Chile this year, they will probably uh, have uh, something of approaching $1 billion in losses due to the algae blooms, due possibly to global warming, to the warm currents and the Humboldt currents, and the algae blooms off the coast of, of uh, Chile, which have resulted in massive losses of cultured salmon, which is a good example that there are perhaps other ways to produce food and there may be more sustainable ways as well. This is how contemporary salmon aquaculture is conducted. They're in net pens or sea cages. I won't spend a lot of time on them. There's another view a little closer. Uh, this is not a free lunch uh, in terms of production. It does take energy. There are well boats. There are uh, people that have to service these, they have to feed these fish. Uh, there's a cost for construction. There are leases for these sites. Uh, it's a regulated industry both in Norway and in Chile and in other countries where it's operated. Primarily, it's very useful in countries where you have fjords, protected waterways, and coastal waterways that are suitable for the anchoring and, and the production of fish in this system. It's not a bad way to grow salmon, and I think there's room for all the possible ways to grow salmon, but I think it's only one way to grow salmon, and I'll, I'll tell you what we think uh, might be possible in countries that don't have fjords and don't have coastal uh, regions of cold water like Norway and southern Chile. You've already seen this. These are sisters. These fish came from the same spawn. They differ in one gene. The, the, the fish in this picture are one year old. The fish in the foreground weighs about 400 grams, and the fish in the background is more than a kilo. Uh, the one gene is the growth hormone gene construct that Yanni has already introduced you to. The resulting phenotype is a rapid growth resulting in a four to six fold increase in the growth rate in the young salmon. Now it's important to, to remind you that the reason young salmon grow slowly is that their normal endogenous growth hormone gene is regulated by photoperiod, food availability, and water temperature. This is an evolutionary fact which is part of the biology of the Atlantic salmon. The way that Aqua Advantage differs is we've given it another copy, another single copy of a growth hormone gene producing the same growth hormone, but it's regulated so that the gene is on and as long as the water temperatures are permissive and there's food available, the fish will grow. If there's no food available, 
there's no benefit. It's like having a car, no matter how big the engine is, if you don't put gas in the tank, it won't run very well. And the same is true for these, these transgenic animals, both in the Atlantics, in our experience, in the experience of Moreau and Fleming, and also in the cohos and, and the Devlin studies, and now in a number of other species, it's been demonstrated over and over and over again that there's no benefit to transgenesis or increasing the growth hormone levels if the fish are not uh, fed to satiety. If there's no food and energy available, it doesn't matter how many growth hormone genes you have and how it's regulated. You've already seen the construct. The point of this slide is after the initial injection event and selection for the founder, and this is a source of much confusion in the literature, in the, in the lay literature, uh, the, the original founder fish was created in 1989. Since that time, we've been breeding this fish for now almost 25 years, over 12 generations. For our application for the new animal drug application with FDA, we had to show, and we showed over eight generations, that the gene was in exactly the same place and had exactly the same function or phenotype as the first founder fish. Now, how many things do you put on your table at home where you have a 12-generation pedigree and you know what the history of that, that food has been for now more than 25 years? So this is arguably the most studied food in history, certainly the most studied fish. Again, coming back, one of the benefits to having a higher growth hormone level is that rapid growth phenotype. That rapid growth phenotype now makes the fish get to market weight in a shorter time, and you can grow it in a land-based contained system. In, in the net pens, they grow the small fish in hatcheries, then they put the smolts into these net pen structures, and they grow them to market weight here. And the idea is that it's less intensive, you feed the fish, but you have all the service elements and all of the other things that I mentioned. You also have seals and sharks that get into the nets. You have weather events that destroy the nets or remove them from their moorings. The fish escape or other bad things happen or you have an algae bloom and you kill all the fish or you have outbreaks of infectious salmon anemia and wipe out a whole geographic area of production, such as happened in Norway and Chile and other regions. Um, the analogy I always use when I talk to groups is it's like having one child with a runny nose in a daycare center. There's no such thing. If you have millions of, of any organism in an environment and there's a pathogen present, you're not going to have one sick animal. They're all sick. So if you can accelerate the growth rate, you can now put these in a, a more contained environment where you can control, as Yanni has already told you, the water, the water quality. There's no exposure to pathogens. There's no exposure to, to wild stocks. And there's no impact on biological diversity. But if you put the unmodified salmon with its slow growth rate in these facilities, basically, unless you have a very low cost of utilities, you're going to be on the, on the razor's edge of being profitable. So one, one point that I want to make, and it's a commercial for the industry, and I think Yanni's already laid the groundwork for it, and that is molecular biology and molecular genetics offers great opportunity in human medicine. It offers great opportunity in other areas of our life. And in aquaculture, the opportunities are enormous. Most aquaculture species, whether they be bluefin tuna, bronzini, uh, tilapia, are basically wild animals that are thrown into tanks and grown to maturity and then sold. It's only been in the last few years, and primarily in salmonids and trout, and to some extent in tilapia, where family breeding studies and applications of even modern genetics have been employed to select for animals with higher productivity. The opportunities in aquaculture for improved productivity, more rapid growth rate, disease resistance, improved composition, improved nutritional qualities, and so forth, using the techniques of modern molecular biology and molecular genetics is simply enormous. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that can go out there. Yanni's already told you that this is probably, other than insects, some of the most feed-efficient organisms available and the highest quality protein available. With developing middle classes, and demands for higher protein in, in diets around the world. Seafood is a very, very real opportunity to elevate those nutritional planes to feed people healthy food and, and to provide a safe and sustainable source of high quality protein. We've mentioned that our fish are triploid. 
the way we, you can do things in fish that you can't do in other species, and I won't go through all the details because it, it gets a little fuzzy, but you, you, can, you can make something called a neomale. And a neomale is a genetic female that you can sex reverse to basically produce milt or sperm. The neomale thus is genetically female but can produce sperm which can be used to fertilize eggs of non-transgenic fish. The neomale in this case also carries two copies of the aqua advantage gene construct that I showed you a few slides ago. So you use the neomale sperm to fertilize the egg and then after the egg is fertilized you expose it to pressure at a certain time and a certain temperature after fertilization and you render all of the eggs triploid. So what you end up with is all of the eggs now are triploid and you can determine that in, a, in an assay using a very sophisticated instrument called a, a fluorescent activated cell sorter, which determines the DNA content in the eggs. So you can basically say with high certainty, and we validated this greater than 99%, that all those eggs are triploid. All those eggs, because Mendelian genetics really does work, all those eggs carry a single copy of the gene construct. So every fish we produce from these, these brood stock are female, carry a single copy of the gene that Yanni's already told you, and is sterile, unable to reproduce to a high degree, greater than 99%. It's only then that those eggs could be released to a grow-out facility for production of the Aqua Advantage salmon. Now, because the FDA regulated us as an animal drug, if you register a veterinary drug, you have a manufacturing site, just like if you're manufacturing a human drug. So we had to have a manufacturing site. Well, in this case, because the egg is the product, we had a hatchery, which is one manufacturing site, but it also produces a fish, which is consumed. So that was also a manufacturing site. So we had to have both of those facilities inspected, and both are approved as part of the consequence of the new animal drug approval. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But that's why all of this other stuff comes in, because we have release assays just as though we were producing a chemical compound. We are the only GMP-regulated product in history that is alive when it's, when it's released. Uh, all, of these, all of the basic methods that we use are the same methods that's used in the pharmaceutical industry. This is how it was regulated, and this is the guidance. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, this is the guidance document that enabled this. The reason it took a long time to get to this is for many, many years there was a debate, even though egg crops were being approved, like uh, herbicide-resistant uh, corn and cotton and soybeans. On the animal side, there was a lot of debate. First of all, did it need to be regulated at all? If so, should USDA regulate it? Should a new food agency regulate it? Should FDA regulate it? And that debate went on for a long time. Finally, there was a product that came through the system that produced human anthrombin A in the milk of a transgenic goat. This is a human pharmaceutical product, and the Center for Biologics was about to approve it. The Center for Veterinary Medicine got wind of this and said, if the human side approves this, we lose the regulatory initiative for all of this because the first transgenic animal will have been approved as a consequence of approving a human pharmaceutical. So over a, a, a period of about six weeks, they got together, reviewed all the data, had a, a veterinary medical advisory committee meeting, and approved that goat over about a two-month period. Now remember, it took us almost 25 years. But this is the political reality of losing that regulatory initiative. So Guidance 187 was the result of that process, and it codified the review and, and criteria for acceptance of a genetically modified animal. Now the good news is, and what we all thought in the industry, and we all supported it, was this was probably the most rigorous review because it was done by people who reviewed drugs and, and materials every day for human food safety, safety to the animal, and safety to the environment. Those are the main components that should be of concern for our society. We were wrong. Even the most rigorous review didn't satisfy people that didn't like this. Now, what we had to do was we had to, first of all, define the product. I've already defined it for you. All female, single copy of the gene, raised in physical containment, and unable to reproduce. We had to show sequences for all of those materials, sequences of the inserted transgene. I've already told you that we've checked over eight generations, and the gene's in the same place and does exactly the same thing. We then had to look at the phenotype and the durability. The durability had to do with 
What does it do to the fish? Are there any changes associated with the presence of the transgene? Uh, what about human food safety? Is there any difference in the animal that's produced? And finally, in a parallel exercise, the environmental assessment that Yoni's already talked about. So the, the, I won't go through the, the process in detail, but it was a, basically a process of negotiation. We would sit down and say, okay, you've de developed this escalating risk assessment model, and there are certain things that you want to know. What's the best way to get that data? We had limitations on space and numbers of animals available, so we had to agree on protocols and agree on studies that would meet their needs and at the same time be, be practical and scientifically meaningful. We certainly wanted to demonstrate under the most robust conditions possible that this product was safe and effective. The additional regulatory steps turned out to be a fiasco. There were public meetings held in 2010 after the FDA concluded its review. It was a fiasco because the FDA got up and said, basically, this is safe and effective. They had consultants that they brought in, uh, Dr. Zohar, uh, Bill Muir from Purdue, uh, Eric Hollerman from, from Virginia Tech. Uh, who all came in and said, we looked at this and we think this is probably better than the contemporary practice and we think this is a good product. In the afternoon, after all of the science had been discussed by FDA and the experts, all of the activist groups got up and said, this will cause an apocalyptic extinction of all life, this will destroy the oceans, this will cause cancer, it will kill your children. And I'm not exaggerating, I mean, it was, it was the longest day of my life. And it was based on zero data. And there was a lot of contentious discussion, and we weren't permitted to respond, nor was the FDA. This, this was a public meeting, and the FDA had decided that the public should have their say. The public wasn't there, but there were a lot of activist organizations were, and they weren't concerned about the truth or the facts. So, FDA findings relevant to composition, and I'm not going to plow through all of this, but basically what they said was, it's an Atlantic salmon, and it's as safe to consume as any Atlantic salmon. And with respect to phenotypic characterizations, they, we, you, we measured everything that you could measure in a salmon. Uh, assessments were made for feeding activity, behavior, posture, position in the water column, coloration, observation of any external lesions, morbidity, mortality, and any abnormal clinical signs. Basically, the conclusion was these were fish. <laughs> they liked to eat, and they were more interested in eating than almost anything else. Conclusion, they showed a, no general health or behavioral abnormalities relative to comparative fish. Interestingly enough, making triploids causes more abnormalities in animals than inserting a transgene. The phenotypic characterization, again, sufficient information to support the safety of the construct. This is all in science and regulatory speak. Uh, to, to convey this to consumers or to the lay community, basically what you can say is it's the same Atlantic salmon producing the same growth hormone that other salmon produce, and it's the same food that you've been eating for as long as we've been eating Atlantic salmon. You cannot measure any detectable difference between Aqua Advantage salmon and any other Atlantic salmon. Now, there are changes that are associated with, and it's important to say, there are changes that are associated with uh, the transgenesis. There's a higher metabolic rate. The animals are capable of growing faster, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, there are some changes associated with triploidy. You get uh, slight deviations on a perculum in certain animals. You sometimes see jaw erosions, which you also see in normal commercial populations of Atlantic salmon. Interestingly enough, we see fewer malformations in our fish than you see in commercial operations in major salmonid producers, because those statistics are available. The environmental assessment was also kind of a trip. We put this together with a consultant, and the FDA did their own version, and we basically looked at every possible environmental circumstance. Suppose you had a seismic event. Suppose you had uh, uh, a tidal wave. Suppose you had a volcanic event. Uh, suppose you had a flood. What, what would be the risk? What would be the outcome? And at the time we were doing this, there wasn't a lot of ecological data available. There is now, and some of it was already presented, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the environmental assessment basically considered every possible scenario and, decide, and had to address the question, what's the risk, and has the risk been mitigated, and is there an additional risk if the animals were to somehow escape? This is a paper that came out in 2011, and it came out of uh, Memorial University, uh, Derek Moreau and Ian Fleming, and they looked at intact males. We gave them the fish. These are Aqua Advantage fish but they're diploid males, so these are fertile fish. And they were put into artificial mesocosms and their reproductive uh, 
behavior was evaluated. This is one of several studies that was done at Memorial University. And there's, a, there's an interesting fact here. You had to kind of cook the books a little bit to do these studies because Yanni's shown you the data and it's well known both in Devlin's work and in other work including uh, Moreau and, and Fleming that if the fish are all raised in an artificial mesocosm, there's no increase in size and the, the aqua advantage fish actually don't sexually mature as quickly as the wild type fish. You don't see precocious uh, maturation in, in aqua advantage. Uh, probably for other reasons, but uh, you have to take the aqua advantage fish and feed them to satiety and get them up to, to a breeding size and then put them in to do these kinds of studies. When you do that, you still find that these fish uh, basically are less effective in breeding. They're more interested in eating than sex, it turns out. Uh, they, they exhibited uh, reduced nest fidelity, quivering frequency, spawning participation, uh, they were less uh, aggressive, uh, they, they basically were less effective in mating than the non-transgenic comparators. This has also been observed in cohos uh, by Devlin. Uh, I'll talk about some other studies that were done uh, also, but the, the, the difference is about a tenfold difference. If there's a tenfold difference in reproductive capacity between two organisms, it will disappear probably in a single generation if it's thrown out into the wild. These were fertile fish compared to an artificial mesocosmos. So even with emerging data like this, we were still aware that people would be concerned, and we were concerned, because the last thing we wanted was the concern or the accusation that somehow we could negatively affect biological diversity. Coming now back to, to the approval in 2015, what was approved was the female population, single copy of the gene, raised in containment. There were a lot of post-approval requirements, uh, monitoring the fish, reporting uh, the incidence of malformations, reporting the performance of the fish, and so forth and so on. This is typical for a pioneering application. The first one in a new class, you do a lot more monitoring. After a few years, generally, if the FDA finds there's nothing unusual or extraordinary, they will allow you to drop this. So it's not a particularly onerous thing. And to be honest, we were so thrilled uh, in receiving the approval after almost 25 years that we didn't care what the post-approval <laughs> requirements were. We would have done anything. If they'd have asked us to jump through flaming loops, we would have done it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the facilities, because one of the, the, the components here is uh, the risk of environmental escape and, and influence in negative uh, negatively impacting biological diversity. Uh, our hatchery is a secure facility. Uh, the egg incubation area, what we call the early rearing area, this is, where, this is where the young fish are kept, which is physically separated and isolated from the grow out area where the larger brood stock are maintained. Uh, I'll show you, uh, this is basically a diagram of the containment. Without going through all the details, there are at least four containment devices between any life stage and a potential effluent from the hatchery. This is a recirculating facility, but uh, for instance, there are uh, sock filters in the lines, there are filters in the, in the standpipes, uh, there's drum filter in both the GOA and in the uh, ERA, uh, so that the, the water runs through a series of barriers, at least four such barriers, before it can ever get to a potential effluent. Uh, we normally run a 95% research, very little water comes out of this facility, but those containment devices are inspected every day. In the hatchery, in, in the heath stacks, you can see that the screens are designed so that uh, an egg can't get through them, nor can a yolk sac fry. And there are subsequent uh, three more barriers before it hits the floor drain, uh, so that there's redundant physical containment, in addition to the fact that the eggs start out sterile and all female. <laughs> In, in the tanks themselves, you see the standpipes have uh, basically uh, either stainless steel discs fitted in the bottom as well as these uh, centered discs in the top. And this is a drum filter for any of you who know what a drum filter is. Basically, it takes all the sludge and all the crap and everything else out of it. Nothing can get through the drum filter. To clean out a drum filter, which you have to do from time to time, we have a built-in clean-out system so that it's fully contained even when it's taken out for, for clean-out purposes. The containment sumps all carry these sock filters uh, attached to the PVC. 
Everything coming through all these flora drains is double, triple, or quadruple filtered before it ever enters any of the sewer systems. Every day, the staff inspect these in the morning and in the afternoon, showing the integrity of the containment system. They initial it, and if they find anything unusual in, in the system, this happens both in PE and it happens in Panama. So we have redundant biosecurity measures, whoops, getting ahead of myself, multiple containment uh, to prevent, you have not only, sorry, you, you have not only biological containment, and I've already told you that there's good evidence now that uh, in artificial ecosystems that they probably wouldn't do very well in the wild anyway, uh, but you also have multiple containment barriers. Uh, in Panama, we have an extra level of containment, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. This is our Panama farm. Uh, this farm is not a recirculating facility. Water comes in, water goes out. Uh, but it has the same, even though it's a, a low cost, uh, relatively primitive, the young fish are, are reared in small tanks here, and then these are the grow out tanks. But it has the same sort of features that we have in our hatchery. Uh, you have inline sock filters, uh, multiple barriers between every life stage and every level. Uh, going through, you have sock filters on the effluents, going through containment sumps with stainless steel, uh, uh, basically sieves, uh, going through a containment sump, and then going through four settling ponds before the water is released back into the river. There's a security fence, there are dogs on the property 24 hours, and there's somebody that lives there. So there's someone always in attendance. We have uh, covering on the tanks to keep the eagles out of the fish, which is good for us and good for for uh, the environment, uh, perhaps not good for the eagles, but uh, just as in our other locations, we have these uh, devices, as you can see here, both in the top and the bottom of the standpipe. So you have these multiple redundant containment elements uh, built to assure that nothing can get out. In our hatchery in Prince Edward Island, we've been operating there for now nearly 20 years, and we have never lost a single fish. And we're inspected by four major agencies three in Canada and the FDA from the US on a periodic basis with unannounced inspections. So this is an example of the, the stainless steel filter box in Panama. Uh, basically with the water flowing through at this velocity, if a fish were to get so far in the containment system, it would basically be pureed in, in the stainless steel uh, dust system because you can see the velocity coming out there uh, and, and would basically destroy the fish, shoving it through the, the, the stainless steel mesh. Uh, all of these, and there, there are containment devices, uh, even on the settlement ponds, uh, and there are four of those in series before the water is released back in the river. Again, they're, they're uh, inspected twice a day, uh, and any annotations, any irregularities are noted, and subject to periodic inspection, both by the authorities of Panama and by the FDA. There's one additional barrier, which is a geothermal barrier in Panama. At Panama, we're at 1,500 meters. That's a pretty good temperature for uh, growing salmon because the water temperature there coming from the river is 12 to 15 degrees for most of the year. But about six kilometers downriver from where our farm is, where it starts here, and, and you get down here, the water goes up to 22 and 25 degrees. Once you go over 24 degrees centigrade, salmon go off feed and basically die. It's a lethal temperature for them. So as the water flows down to the Pacific from the Rio Calderas through the Los Valles and through the Rio Cherokee, salmon goes through what would be a lethal thermal event. In addition, there are six hydroelectric power plants between our farm and where the, the river enters the Pacific. That is sort of like putting, would be like putting a fish through a wearing blender because the turbines would certainly destroy and they, they basically take uh, the water out of the river, run it through the turbine, and run it back in. So uh, between the, the physical containment, the biological containment at our site, the geothermal containment uh, at the downriver sites, and then the existence of the hydroelectric power plants, there is virtually no chance that a live animal or a live fish uh, could transit and, and survive going to the Pacific. And even if it got to the Pacific, there's nowhere to go because uh, it's at a, temp a, a prohibitive temperature for growth. So another uh, paper in evolutionary applications, again by uh, Moreau and Fleming, the transgenic salmon exhibit reduced breeding efficiency greater than tenfold 
when compared to anadromous wild-type salmon in an artificial mesocosm. Again, as these things started to come out, they gave us greater confidence and gave us greater ability to point to published literature in independent research labs, not particularly favorable to us. And in fact, when they wrote their studies, they always concluded that these fish could potentially mate. Well, of course they could potentially mate. They were intact, fertile animals. Uh, but under the conditions of their own studies, they were tenfold or greater less effective in mating, which almost certainly would result in, in them disappearing from the population. So uh, again, we think this is good data, even though at the time uh, the authors didn't particularly represent it in a very favorable light. While all this was happening, just before the approval, the Center for Food Safety in the US uh, began a very highly publicized campaign. Uh, they took the same data that the FDA said was equivalent to all other Atlantic salmon, and they took the minimums or the maximums in, in the statistical ranges and put out a label with the skull and crossbones on it and, and basically said, uh, are you going to sell this fish in your store? And they sent it to all the distributors, they sent it to all the restaurants, and they sent it to all the food service groups. They also picketed Costco and tried to isolate them uh, because Costco didn't uh, respond quickly enough to their demands. And they put a lot of pressure on Costco and Walmart to, to promise in advance when no product was available that they would never sell genetically modified salmon. Uh, we talked to all of these organizations and we understood the tremendous pressure that they were under. We had no product available and we understood the positions that they took, but it was not a fact-based or even fair uh, process and they weren't troubled by the facts. Uh, the FDA had published all of their data and had public meetings and these groups deliberately misrepresented the facts. And that was a real um, unpleasant and rude awakening for us because we realized that despite the fact that you've fulfilled all of the requirements and you met all the rules and you were transparent, perhaps the most transparent application in history, there really wasn't much benefit because the people who wanted to attack you weren't troubled by facts or truth or even honesty. Last but not least, the Alaskans were really upset because they thought that we would somehow cut into their markets. And if you know, I like Pacific salmon. There are five economically important Pacific salmon. Uh, it's a really good fish. So is Atlantic salmon. But Pacific salmon are sold in distinct marketing chains and sold in a completely different way. And it's a different product. They're Uncorhynchus, we're Salmo, Salar. It's a different product, different composition, different texture, different appearance. And they sell 60% of their product in the Far East. Even Alaskan analysis will tell you that Alaskans have other issues with their marketing, and they do a good job, by the way, than the existence of Aqua Advantage. When they overfish their sockeyes, the sockeye price goes down. When they do that, they go to the federal government and say, please subsidize us by buying all our excess capacity and putting it into cans for surplus food, which they did last year. It's a problem that we have that is continuing because the senators in Alaska fear us as an economic competitor, despite the fact that the U.S. already imports 260,000 tons. We believe that we'll compete with that 260,000 tons of imported Atlantic salmon and not the wild-caught salmon industry because that's a distinct product. But anyway, that battle is going to go on for a while. There are now five states, maybe six today, uh, that are all proposing risks. Most of these bills proposed by people who are up for re-election next year. Turns out we're an easy target. Uh, it's part of the GMO labeling, GMO controversy, which is turning out to be a very interesting one and continuing. Uh, but what, what we hope is that these sorts of growth rates and the fact that we can grow in a sustained land-based system will be helpful to us in the long term if we can persuade people that this may have benefits. And here's an example, and I'll go through these slides very quickly. In a, a, a study that was published in 2015, uh, the, the, in a, using an artificial diet and using transgenic and non-transgenic salmon, uh, the, the feed intake of Aqua Advantage was three times higher than the non-transgenic control. Not surprising, they like to eat. They also grew three times as fast. The thermal growth coefficient was three times. Makes a lot of sense. Interestingly, the feed conversion rate was 20% lower for the transgenic animal than the non-transgenic. So to get to the same weight, it took 20% less feed. They ate faster, they ate more, but they grew faster. More importantly, their nitrogen retention 
and their lipid retention were both significantly improved compared to the non-transgenic. That means they were a lot more efficient in conserving some of the most expensive nutrients in their feed. This is what allows them to be grown in land-based contained systems. More importantly, and, and this is a, a point that I want to make, if you could place one of these within 500 miles of any American population center, put it in the Midwest serving the Chicago in the Midwest, put it in uh, the Mid-Atlantic serving the New York, uh, Philadelphia quarter, uh, maybe somewhere out here serving the, the Midwest and, and Southwest, you could truck those fish 500 miles. The transportation costs would be 10 cents per kilo versus the $2 per kilo that it is today when you're flying those fish from Oslo or flying them from Santiago or Puerto Montt. More importantly, the carbon footprint associated with that transportation is 25-fold reduced if you can transport them that 500 miles using a truck instead of flying them in 747s. So the environmental impact of that transportation in both the cost and the carbon footprint is significant, if not enormous. So what does one of these things look like? It looks like a warehouse. It looks like a building complex. This is an aquaculture facility. This is what it looks like inside. They're big warehouses with big tanks with recirculating systems. This is at Langs and Lax in Denmark, uh, on the, the west coast of Denmark. This is a thousand metric ton facility. Uses wind energy. They produce biogas just like Yanni does in Baltimore. Uh, they feed their generators with that. They produce a thousand metric tons of salmon a year. Xinjiang, China, thousand metric tons a year salmon production. Jurassic salmon in Poland, hydrothermic water pulled from thousands of feet under the earth. And that's also perhaps millions of years old and, and used to grow salmon in Poland in that same sort of footprint that I've been discussing. So this land-based system, and this is a, a diagram of one, what one looks like, can be placed anywhere. You can place it in South Dakota. You can place it in Illinois. You can place it in upstate New York. Put it in Wisconsin. We don't grow salmon, we don't grow significant salmon in the US now. Instead of importing 260,000 tons a year, we could grow it economically and environmentally sustainably in the United States. Why don't you do that today? Because regular fish don't grow fast enough. They're not efficient enough. If you can improve that efficiency and improve that growth rate, it opens the door for land-based contained aquaculture. So we think that with the containment system available, the biological and physical containment, the redundant containment systems, and these land-based systems, this is the future of protein production for species like salmon. And if you look at the issues associated with sea cages, and I'm not an advocate for land-based only, certain countries like Norway and Chile have opportunities for sea cages. They have the geography and they have the coastline. In the US, we don't. But exposure to pathogens, escape of fish, predators, medications, fouling of coastal waterways, and all these issues are associated with the so-called low-cost alternative. And it's not so low-cost, because we can produce aqua advantage in land-based RAS systems at a lower cost per kilo than these guys can in sea cages. Wild cod is a whole other issue. That's a completely different product. But wild cod is not really wild cod anyway. It's ranched. Alaska has probably more hatcheries than any, any state in the United States. They release over 2 billion smolts a year. They put them out in the Pacific, and they catch about 4% of them when they mature three or four years later. And they call that wild cod. I'm not against it. But I'm just saying nobody knows what the genetics are. Nobody knows what the impact on wild populations are. And it's a completely different product. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for the future. Uh, but most importantly, I think what we really need to remember is it's really about the food. And I think I ran a little over, but thank you very much. No, there was only one. Oh. How do you guys want to do this? He doesn't have a mic. Do you have another handheld? That's it. Yeah. They're wearing mics. No, but there's only one. There's only one level there. All right, well, let's get started with the questions. Hi. Um, 
My name is Michelle, I work here at the aquarium, and we're always given uh, questions about this. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is the size of the facility, because when you look at producers of other proteins, they require really mass land to do that. Have we looked at the comparable size uh, output? And because this just seems like a real no-brainer when it comes to the amount of food that you can produce in such a small area. That, that's a great question. Whoops. <laughs> Let's, uh, let me remove my device here. As, as I think I mentioned in the first slide, uh, salmon aquaculture already uses a, a very small space compared to, to uh, the fisheries. Um, and there, the real answer to your question is that there's really two issues. For land-based systems, there's, and, and depending on the species, depending on the growth rates, depending on the yields, there's sort of a sweet spot. And it might be different for salmon than it would be for tilapia or kobe or other ones. But, um, and you get up to a certain size facility, the cost per kilo is low because of the economy of scale. And then it, it doesn't get much lower as you get bigger. So what you want to do is find that sweet spot. In salmonids, we think that sweet spot is something around six to 10,000 metric, ton 6, metric tons per year. The size of that is about the size of a medium-sized warehouse. Uh, the water requirements are not huge. And what you really want to find is a place that has a good source of water at the right temperature, low utility costs, and preferably flat land with a good base where you can put heavy tanks on. Uh, but it takes a lot less space to produce than it would, because you can grow these fish in fairly high densities, a lot less space than, for instance, fisheries or even net cages or, or other kinds of, of uh, uh, rearing practices. So in terms of the, the space efficiency, it's, it's probably a lot better than almost any other alternative. Uh, Dr. Zohar, you, you said earlier that all, all fish gene constructs need to be done responsibly, not irresponsibly. What did you mean by that? I mean, could you yeah. kind of expand upon that? <clears throat> like, what would irresponsibly be? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know how much you know about uh, the molecular biology. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, so I'll make it simple again, you know. <clears throat> um, and I mentioned it, uh, the, the responsible way will be to take something that the fish already have in them and just increase it a little bit in the level. So you take the fish own growth hormone and I, as I said, every, every gene has two elements to it. There is the engine, the promoter, that drives the expression of the reporter of the growth hormone and so on. And in that case, and I think we're all insistent, we all knew that this is what needs to be done, you have to take this both element from the fish and insert it back to the fish. As opposed to, for instance, many people, and I will not go into the biology of it, because it's easier in many uh, instances, they use promoters, this engine, from viruses. And I mentioned it earlier because they penetrate into cells. But if you use a promoter for a virus, there is a main you know, uh, health issue associated with it because those viral promoters can infect us. I mean, I'm putting it in extreme words, okay? But that will be the non-responsible non way. Or to put a human growth hormone, some people did that, a human growth hormone into fish for them to grow faster because you know, we didn't have the, the, we had the human growth hormone years before we had the fish growth hormone. And those will be the less responsible way. So what you are doing here, you are taking a gene that the fish have anyway, and you're just adding, so you and I and everybody else, we have one copy of the growth hormone genes in our genome, in our chromosome. And you take and you add just one more copy. And as I said, and I showed, it leaves, it, everything is within the physiological level. The growth hormone don't go ballistic. Actually, they did a lot of tests. And uh, you know, I did work with FDA and I did review the data. And if you look in the flesh of the fish, you know, in the muscle or in the skin, you don't see anything. You don't see the growth hormone at all. If you look 
if you go to the blood, you do see with very, very sensitive <coughs> method that you increased it, but it's physiological, it's not pharmacological. And that the responsive versus the less non-responsive, responsible, sorry. Thank you to both speakers. Um, Dr. Stodish, it seems like there's overwhelming amounts of data that these fish are safe to consume, won't get released, are going to be um, easily marketed. But after, on that horrific day where you showed all the data and then you had a lot of anti-factual opposition, um, besides events like these and the reports that come out on these fish, is there more public education or awareness of your product so that more of us can get informed? We, we talked about that a little bit at dinner, and that was part of the appeal for coming here. Um, I, I, I think what, what I'd add to your comment, it's very perceptive, is that uh, I'm, by training, a biochemist molecular biologist, and when I see these opportunities, they're opportunities. You can do really neat stuff. You, you can basically uh, augment uh, and improve performance. Suppose you could uh, change the gene that would uh, change susceptibility to torovirus in shrimp, or prevent white spot disease in shrimp, or prevent in infectious salmon anemia in salmon. Wonderful opportunities. That's the scientist. But to the public, and, and particularly to people who, who for ver a variety of reasons, and some people are well-intentioned, and some, some aren't, but it's, it's changing nature. And Yoni's example, I gave a talk about 15 years ago, and I used the slide, the famous, I think it was a science or nature, where the two mice on the cover, one was expressing human growth hormone, one was bigger than the other. And it was at a, a Missouri uh, governor's conference. And at the Missouri Governor's Conference, uh, all the farmers come in in January because they're not planning and not doing anything. And they talk about science and they talk about agriculture. And I put this, and this, this very nice man stood up and said, how dare you? That's against God's law. And I thought to myself, well, the first thing, I, I better be respectful and I better answer this very carefully because there's a thousand people out there and I don't want to be flip. And I, I thought about it and I said, well, you know, I, I hope you would understand this is an example of the power of the technology, and this is a, a way to treat disease, prevent disease perhaps, cure genetic defects and other opportunities, and, and don't see it as, as violating something that you maybe hold as, as very important or sacred, but try to view this as an opportunity because this is a wonderful opportunity for curing cancer, curing a whole lot of things. Uh, so we chatted a little bit after that. So uh, public perception is something that we've become very aware of. I, when I give talks now, I don't talk about promoter strength. I don't talk about gene copy number. I don't talk about the way we analyze. I, I talk about the, the fish. I talk about the, the barriers and the protections, the risks that we've considered and mitigated, and the things that we're trying to do to, to provide comfort to people. The debate is happening between the scientific organizations, academics, and, and people like me on the one hand, and people on the other end, some of whom have a vested interest in making sure that these products don't get on the market. If you believe what Dr. Zohar told you, and I do, that the fisheries are capped at 100 million tons and have been for more than 30 years and are declining, how are we going to feed that other 2 billion people? And it's not being flip, and it's not being sanctimonious or self-righteous to say that we had better start considering other solutions. And we have an obligation as scientists to try to communicate those in ways that people can understand so that they're not fearful and that they, they don't see uh, any adverse consequences or risk associated with it. So it's something we're going to wrestle with for a long time. But meetings like this, and it's nice to see 50 people come out and, and to, to talk and listen and ask questions. 
And uh, that, that, I think, is something that has to go on. And hopefully, when you go home and go to your church groups, or go to your schools, or wherever you go, when this issue comes up, you'll say, you know, I talked to some goofball the other night, and he gave us a talk, and he said that, you know, that they had all of these, these controls built in. Or I talked to a professor from, from University of Maryland, and he, he laid this out, and I understand it. That, that, I think, is the hope for the future. That and, and the new generation that we have, because I can tell you this, I used to do talks in schools, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I gave a talk at a, at a middle school about three years ago, and I came home and I said to my wife, that's it, I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> and she, she said, why not? I said, I just had a 14-year-old ask me a question that showed that he understood not only what I said, but extrapolated that to possible implications and applications that I didn't understand when I was a graduate student <laughs> or an assistant professor. And, and that was a very humbling event, so no more, no more middle schools. But, the, the kids now are coming up, I mean, they're growing up with cell phones, they're growing up with high technology, but they're also growing up with molecular biology and genetics, and it's a whole new world. That's the hope for the future. Okay, we're going to take two more questions, and then if you guys are okay with it, they can come and talk to you afterwards. Two, long. <laughs> two more questions, and then we got to let these guys go. They've been on a plane. You just mentioned the academics and the scientists, and over there you said, and then, then the opposition. Do the op does the opposition have any studies? Do the opposition have any concrete um, arguments that, is it emotional? Is it, is there, can you, can you represent the other side for a second? I'm gonna let Yanni answer that first. Well, uh, we discussed this over dinner, and uh, I think we we'll said it's like global warming, right? So I don't think that there are many credible scientists that will, tell you or show data uh, to uh, support their claims. I mean, many of the claims that you saw on my slides or on Ron's slides, they are not supported by any data. I mean, there is like, so no, the answer is no. And related to the training and so on, and education, I mean, uh, this is, I mean, this is progress, right? We try, to, we are like understanding now the genes that control every aspect of our life, and we're trying to use it to, uh, to improve our health. That is a, there is a lot of genetic engineering that is helping, I mean, in stem cell technology, that is helping people that have some immune deficiencies to produce, you know, some, uh, some antibodies to overcome some diseases and autoimmunity situation and so on. And there are some genes that we can use to uh, increase crop production and to, to feed the world. Uh, so, so you have to educate people. Uh, again, I also said over lunch, over dinner, that you know, when I wrote this op-ed to uh, CNN, I mean, the, the talkbacks, the comments at the bottom were like, Awful. I mean, you know, people are so obsessed, like we are playing, you know, with Mother Nature, we are playing, and that's not true, and these people need, so, the, the role of education is really important, but I mean, I don't know of any scientific, credible scientific paper that support the claims of the activists that are saying that all this, uh, I was there with Ron at this 2010. Uh, there were people were as we walked into the hearing. There were people dressed in Frankenfish out there, <laughs> and and at the, at the public hearing, they said, as he said, you know, cancer and destroying the ocean and so on. Yeah, we don't want these organisms to be released to the wild. And uh, do the plant crop are they released to the wild or not? For sure they are. But in this case, they are very. Um, uh, very uh, uh, credible studies showing that the fish, as I said and as Ron said, are not going to survive in the wild, yet we don't want them to be released to the wild. And there is no data of you know, supporting the naysayers. No, there is no scientific data in the, the credible literature supporting any of these claims. Yeah, in research, in research, but not, I mean, there were some, yeah, you're right. I mean, there were some, uh, well, suggestion, you know, that that can be used because the viral promoters are very efficient, you know, but, but I mean, uh, they are not being used in any, uh, for sure not in Aqua Advantage, and not any other, I mean, uh, this is the only one right now. Yeah, they're using in research in zebrafish and so on, 
but not in the context of con context of commercial application for you know food production. All right. Well, these guys have had a long day, so we're we're gonna we're we're gonna call it for the the official Q and A. But these guys will be here for a few minutes if you want to come up and talk to them. Don't forget, next week the session is going to be in the theater, which is in the main building. Um, and again, you can bring a guest. Um, please bring your friends, but remember they're gonna be on the hook for their own parking. <laughs> Thank you.